Welcome to ChemExam Explained, where the aim is chemistry clarity exam mastery. In today's video, we will be looking at Cape Chemistry, Paper 2, Unit 2, Module 2. Let's go. A liquid sample of an unknown organic compound was submitted to a lab facility for structural analysis. The sample was irradiated with radiation from various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum labeled A to D as seen in figure 2. So here we have figure 2, we have some letters A, B, C, D. Notice that we are given certain figures. So we have one picometer, we have one nanometer, we have one micrometer, we have one millimeter, we have one centimeter and we have one decimeter. So what we're seeing here is that as we're moving in this direction, wavelength is increasing. Now, if wavelength is increasing in the same direction, it means that frequency is decreasing. So frequency or energy, remember that energy and frequency are directly proportional. So remember this. So using that knowledge, going from D to A, we could say that A being the longest wavelength would be radio waves. Then the one that is shorter than radio wave would be infrared radiation. And then UV vis radiation. And after that we have the shortest one here, which is D, being X-ray. If, if, if we had a letter further down this side, then that would be gamma rays. But we are stopping at X-rays since we are dealing with only four letters. So again, we have A for radio waves, B for infrared radiation, C for UV vis radiation, and D, X-rays. Let's continue. Two part B. Spectra obtained from the excitation of the sample showed an absorption signal at 9.4 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Now this is the same thing as 9.4 times 10 to the 14 per second. Let's write it in. Now I'm going to use per second instead of hertz to show that I'm cancelling my units when I do the calculation. So part one requires that we calculate the wavelength in meters for this radiation. So recall that Hertz is the same as per second. We are going to be using the formula wavelength equal the speed of light in meters per second over the frequency in per second. So we have 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second divided by 9.4 times 10 to the 14 per second. Per second would cancel per second leaving meters. So our answer for the wavelength would be 3.2 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Now, if they want to convert the meters to nanometer, then you could simply divide by 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meter, and that would give us our conversion. But the question requires our answer in meters, so we're not going to convert. B part 2. With reference to figure 2, in what radiation band does the calculated wavelength in B part one belong. So if you notice our calculated value in meters was 3.2 times 10 to the minus 7. And so we look up here and we're looking for that value of 10 to the minus 7. So you'll see that our value would fall somewhere in this range where we have 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 7. So this would be our band C. So our answer would be band C or UV vis radiation. Part 3. A lamp with filament made from the sample emits light of the same wavelength obtained in B part 1. Calculate the energy of a single emitted photon. So here we want to calculate energy. Now from the formula E equal Planck's constant times frequency we could just put in the value for Planck's constant. Again, it's a constant, so we must know this constant. It is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules second times the frequency of 9.4 times 10 to the 14 per second. And that will give us our energy of 6.2 times 10 to 
times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Another way we could work this problem is to use a formula energy equal Planck's constant times the speed of light over wavelength. And this wavelength was calculated before, so we just put in Planck's constant times the speed of light constant divided by the wavelength that was calculated, and we get the same answer of 6.2 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Let's continue. Part C. Acetyl salicylic acid is a well-known drug that is commonly known as aspirin. To determine the concentration of acetyl salicylic acid in a sample of unknown concentration, a student ground 10 aspirin tablets into a fine powder and dissolved it in water to make a stock solution of 250 cm cube for titration. So when they ground it, it means that they crushed the tablets into powder form. Thereafter, 25 cm cube of the solution was titrated with an excess of standard sodium hydroxide solution. The equation and table below show the reaction between aspirin and standard sodium hydroxide along with two possible titration options. So here we have our aspirin, aka our acetyl salicylic acid, and it is titrated with sodium hydroxide. And we form sodium salicylate and sodium acetate plus water. So let's look at the table. So we have two options in our table. In option one, we see where our aspirin is reacting with a strong base sodium hydroxide to form the salt, your sodium acetate and your sodium salicylate plus water. In equation two, we're looking at aspirin, which is the acetyl salicylic acid plus sodium hydroxide which forms the salt sodium acetyl salicylate plus water. Now, if you look at both titration, you're seeing here in titration one, we're looking at titrating the excess of the sodium hydroxide with 0.1 mole per diem cube of an acid. So in this case, we are titrating a strong base with a strong acid. So this seems to be back titration. In titration 2, we are titrating the acetyl salicylic acid with a strong base sodium hydroxide. So in titration 1, we have a strong base with a strong acid. In titration 2, we are titrating a weak acid with a strong base. Now for part 1, state which acid would be appropriate to use in option 1. So if we are doing the back titration and we are titrating the sodium hydroxide with the aspirin, the sodium hydroxide is in excess. So it must be titrated with a strong acid. So any of the following can be used, sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid. Let's move on. See part two. In the space below, draw the titration curve that would be obtained for option one. So remember, we are titrating a strong acid with a strong base and the alkali is in the conical flask and the acid is in the burette. So the titration will start at a high pH and as you add the acid, it starts to neutralize and it will drop to a low pH between one and three. And that should be your titration curve. C part three. In the space below, draw the titration curve that would be obtained for option two. So in option two, we are titrating the strong alkali with a weak acid. And so the alkali will be in the burette and the acid will be contained in the conical flask. So we are starting low and as you add sodium hydroxide to the acid, the pH will rise. And this is a titration curve for a weak acid and a strong base. C part four, using the information in table two below, select the indicator that cannot be used for the titrations. All right, so looking at the table two, which is the commonly used indicators and their pH ranges, we're looking at methyl violet as the one that cannot be used for this titration. Now, the reason for this is that the methyl violet changes color at a pH range that is outside the range of the equivalence point. That is, it is too low to get a color change. Let's look back at the graph for option one. 
Looking at option one graph, you'll see that 0, 0.0 to 1.0 would be too low. Hence, it would be outside the range for the equivalence point. So that one cannot be used. So as you can see here, methyl violet would be too low to get a color change. The range that is would be too low to get a color change. All right, so let's look at option two. We're saying that methyl orange having a range of 3.1 to 4.4 or methyl violet having a range of 0.0, .0 to 1.0 would be too low. So the color changes at a pH range that is outside the range of the equivalence point would not be suitable because it will be too low to get a color change. Let's go back to the pH curve for option two. So you'll see here that for option two, right off here, zero to 1.0, or 3.3 to 4.4 would be outside the range of the equivalence point. Hence, it would not be suitable indicators for this titration. So for option two, methyl orange or methyl violet would be too low to get a color change. Part five, the titration results obtained from option two are listed below. Complete the table by filling in the spaces. Now this is your regular titration table. So as you can see, we have values already in the table. We have the final reading, we have the initial reading, and we are now to calculate the volume used or the tighter volume. So 30.80 minus 11.30 gives us 19.50. 29.00 minus 9.70 gives us 19.30. And 30.00 minus 10.80 gives us 19.20. And if you observe all three readings, you'll see that these two are within plus and minus 0.1. So these are the values we're going to use to calculate our average titer volume or mean titer volume. So when you add 19.30 plus 19.20 divided by 2, you get 19.25 cm cube as our volume that we will use in our calculation. Part 6. Given that the stock solution of 250 cm cube contained 10 tablets, use the information in C part 5 to calculate the number of milligrams of aspirin contained in a titrated volume of 25 cm cube of aspirin. And we got the molar mass for the aspirin to be 180.06 grams per mole. So what do we have? We have the volume from our table. So this is the average tighter volume that we calculated from the two accurate readings. So to start this calculation, let's look at a few things. What do we know? We already know the volume from our table. This is the average volume that we calculated from the two accurate readings. We then look back in our table and you'll see that we have the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. So we can find the moles of sodium hydroxide using the concentration and the volume from the table. The volume must be in dm cube, so we'll divide this value by 1000 to get 0 0.01925 dm cube. The calculation now involves the molar concentration of 0.1 times the volume of 0 0.01925 dm cube, and we get a value of 1.925 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. So you'll see that dm cube would cancel dm cube our value will be in moles we are then going to look at the equation and we'll see that the mole ratio between the sodium hydroxide and the aspirin is one to one that means that the moles of the aspirin is also 1.925 times 10 to the minus 3 moles once we know the moles we can now calculate the mass we'll use the formula moles equal mass over molar mass and we'll sub to make mass the subject of the formula so mass is equal to moles times molar mass so the moles is 1.925 times 10 to the minus 3 times the molar mass that was given in the question to be 180.06 gram per mole here again we have moles cancelling mole so our unit will be in grams so our mass is 0 0.347 grams we can convert the grams to milligrams because you recall that the question requires that the value, the number, must be in milligrams. So our mass must be in milligrams. 
So to convert mass to milligrams, we'll divide the mass that we calculated by 1 times 10 to the minus 3 to get 347 milligrams. And that is your answer for the mass of aspirin contained in a titrated volume of 25 cm cube. Part 7. The ingredient table below lists the milligrams quantities of aspirin in a single tablet. So here we have table 3, it says milligram quantities of active ingredient in a single tablet of aspirin. The active ingredient in the aspirin is between, they say the acceptable range in one tablet is 285 to 315 milligrams. All right, and this is for a standard strength aspirin tablet. So based on the findings in C, and what we found in C was that our mass was 347 milligrams per tablet. So based on the findings in C part six, state whether the information in table three is accurate and give a reason for your answer. So we're saying that no, the value is not accurate, all right? So the value in table three is not accurate as the mass given of 285 to 350 milligrams is less than the calculated value of 347 milligrams from the titration. So with that value, we can compare with what they have in the table and we'll see that if our value was between any of these values here, if our value was say 285 or anywhere between 285 and 315, then the value in the table would be correct. But based on our calculation, our value is higher than the value stated in the table. Hence, the value in the table is not accurate based on our findings. This is the end of question two, unit two, module two for the year 2024. Please remember to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you will be notified. Thank you.